Hello, um, my name is John McAuliffe and I'm a poet based in Manchester, but I'm originally from Listowel, the home of Writers Week. And today I'm going to be talking to poet Miriam Gamble about her book, What Planet, which is this year's winner of the Listowel Writers Week Piggott Prize. Every year, Mark Piggott generously endows the prize and there's a terrific roll call of winners over the last number of years of the prize, including Alva Darcy, Colette Bryce, Von O'Rourke, and others. This year, speaking about the Piggott Prize, the judge, poet Ian Macmillan said, in terrible and turbulent times, poetry can offer us a map out of lockdown and social distancing. So many Irish poets are working at the height of their powers, wrestling with language to make it fit the world that we live in. Today, I'm going to talk to Miriam about What Planet, a book which fits Ian's description very well. As the title What Planet suggests, there is a sense in Miriam's book, as there is in all of her books, that she is working the language, what planet are you on, that she is working the language with all of her craft and wit to bring the world and her imagination of it together in the poems. Miriam lives in Edinburgh, which is where I talk to her today. She teaches at the university there, but she grew up in Belfast and her childhood and the city of Belfast features um, in this book more maybe than it has done in her work before now. I began by asking her about that and to read one of the poems which reflects this aspect of what planet. Got ease. On this shoe you have centred all your hopes of becoming a finished person. You tie it onto you and wait for the magic to occur. You've perceived how, in the playground lines, it heat seals the tips of other children, the exclamatory stroke that signals an artwork, how it holds them like a cup holds juice. And now you tie it onto you, you admire the clean white leather with the emerald flashes, imitation Adidas out of Duns, but its credentials are neither here nor there. It is the only hope for you, and you tie it on tightly, though admittedly, even in the shop. The alchemy drains out of it, inverse to your clammy presence, with which desire and gain have nothing to do. Thanks, Miriam. Um, Miriam, I suppose that this poem is striking for a number of reasons. There's sort of something about this attachment to the object which won't quite do what you want it to do. Um, in the poem, but also it's written in the second person. And I wondered if you could say something about that choice to write that poem with you at the, at the, at the centre of it rather than I. Sure. I mean, I think quite, quite a lot of the poems in the book actually are written in second person. Um, it's always a little bit difficult for me uh, kind of looking back to determine <laughs> why, <laughs> why I did particular things. I mean, I think in some sense, uh, maybe just got tired of the eye and of the sort of um, presumption or inevitable gravitation towards the eye. But I think there's also something interesting about second person that's a sort of a, um, there's an, uh, a dimension of it which turns the poem from talk, you performing yourself for other people to you talking to yourself, which other people can listen in on. Uh, and uh, So I think there's, I mean, many of these poems are kind of me as an adult talking to myself as, as a child, I, I suppose. And, th and then there's also a, a, a way in which it um, kind of others you from yourself in ways that I find quite interesting. I mean, there's a poem in my second book called Childhood, which is um, in the first person, uh, kind of with the self in the first person and the third person, the adult self as I and the child self as her. And I suppose it's, it, it's both a meeting point, <laughs> a midway point between those where that, you know, there is no I in the poem, just um, a kind of unidentified self uh, addressing the you of, of um, the self as child, although not all of the second person poems are, are set in childhood. But um, yeah, I just, I like that um, kind of simultaneous intimacy and distance it produces. When, did, when, I suppose one of these questions you're always interested in as a poet is when did this book come into focus as a book and was the you one of these things that made you think of the poems together? Um, 
That's a really hard question for me that actually because poet books um books just arise at a certain point I think where for me when you know I don't write like I don't write a book uh to um set out with parameters in advance of the kinds of things that I'm going to cover and the way in which I'm going to do it. Um, I just write kind of bunches of poems and then the book gets made <laughs> uh, when I have a look at those and um, and see whether I feel that I have one or not. And with this one, actually, I didn't think, you know, I thought I was miles off having a book, but it didn't really feel like I had that much work or that I knew what I was doing with it, really. Um, and then at whatever point that I just gathered them together just to see what I did have, I sort of realised that I already had one. I mean, I don't know if, um, I don't know that second person was kind of steering. Um, I guess I, like, there's quite a lot of prose poems in the book as well, which was a kind of pleasurable uh, happening for me because I've been trying to write prose poems for years and doing, failing <laughs> really badly and always having to walk away from them because they didn't, I just couldn't strike the right note in them or, or they sounded fake or like they were aping somebody else's prose poems or you know that they did I didn't have a feel for them um and I guess similar with second person uh, I got a hold of it and it was something that I liked and then a number of things came out that way to the point that I then had to start going okay why are you automatically writing this poem in second person or why are you automatically writing this as a prose poem um I, I, I trust that sense of books happening poem by poem, certainly more than I do the, the, the project book, which can, it's not, it, it, there, there are a lot of them and not all of them are able to fill out their parameters really um, um, as easily. Um, one of the things I, I think I've admired about your poems from your first book onwards is the, the kind of the, the way in which you look very closely at something, Miriam, and the way that you're kind of, <laughs> that, that you, the poems really kind of stick stick to what they want to say about the thing that they're looking at. And it's almost like you're testing each phrase and whether it will fit when it's being held up and kind of tapped on either side to see if it's if the if it actually is going to be in keeping with what you want to say. So it's a poetry that seems to me to be written without false notes. But one of the poems, um, that I, I think you'd like you you're going to read now is um, the oak um, that was not there, um, which I think really does have that sense of seeing something, but also crediting a particular way of looking. And I wonder if you could say something about that poem um, uh, before you read it. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's uh, there are quite a lot of quite odd poems in this book. I think, <laughs> and I think the oak that was not there is quite high on the. Mm. Uh, spectrum of odd <laughs> that it uh, that it inhabits um i mean i i don't know if i can say anything especially clever about it uh it came uh, i suppose it's one of those poems a little bit that's kind of patched uh, or it patched itself together out of different things i mean it responded in part to an image of um that disappointed me in i think war and peace which i have to admit with shame i've never read but i heard i uh, heard it being it was being played on radio four over new year um, and i was in the car for you know in and out of hearing stretches of it and there's this scene where uh, there's an oak, a blasted oak tree um, when one of the characters is riding towards a farmhouse and then when he comes out of the farmhouse a transformation has been performed on this oak tree because he's fallen in love in the time that he was in there um, and I was so disappointed that it just had bloomed. I wanted to have <laughs> disappeared yeah. or something. And so <laughs> that's, uh, it was partly that. And then uh, partly also just a memory of uh, having been stranded as a child with my great aunt who used to take me and my sister out for the day to get us off our parents' hands, um, who took us out to a wee island off the coast somewhere in Northern Ireland, which my mother has told me about 17 times. And every time I forget where it was, but you could access it on foot. Um, it's kind of like Cramond Island here. You could access it on foot um, when the tide was out, but you had to time it, come back in and, and she got it wrong. So we got temporarily stuck there. And uh, God only knows how <laughs> those two things, this is what I arrived at, but <laughs> it is. Um, the oak that was not there. The oak that was not there was not there, and the sands went walking under the sea. The clocks went forward, the clocks went back. Someone lost their temper with me. 
from a hillock, we looked on as water swept its grey silk garment through the estuary. The clocks went forward, the clocks went back. The penitent, down on his knees, begged for the honey of forgiveness from around God whose presence we had proven. The clocks went forward, the clocks went back, there was no response. But we must act responsibly, said our grave leader, as the flowers of the macker grew scissor faces. On their faces, the hands of the second went chop, chop, chop. The digitalis ate a mink. To think, one murmured, that it should come down to this. Another nodded. Consent, there is something wrong as the blown glass nimbi angled and clinked, and the clocks went back and forwards, back and forwards. Where is the oak for one thing? Where is the blasted oak? And the round god fell from the sky like a fish. Ridiculous last line. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been very pleased with it though. I was, yeah. I mean, I kind of I remember writing it and just feeling, like, whoop, what the hell did that yeah. come from? I mean, it does, I, I agree with you, it does kind of, it does stick to a thing. And I suppose if, you know, if one boils the thing down, it's a sense of kind of impending environmental disaster that it, um, mm. that it kind of sits within and um, uh, explores. But. Yeah, I might, um, I, I might come back to that in a second, but I suppose the other thing that I could hear in this is McNeese mm -hmm. and they're the lovely refrain that you use, which seems to have some kind of uh, other perspective on the things that are going on with this with this clock. And is he is he somebody you're still reading, Miriam, or is it is, is he part? Is he just built into how you think about the poems? Yeah, I think he is seeded quite deep. I mean, I haven't revisited him um, in any kind of uh, volume for quite a while, but um, certainly those later books that I, I can completely see, like Solstices, The Burning Perch, those kind of spectral, <laughs> um, ghosty, uh, ghostly kind of... Um, freaky I suppose poem yeah. you know, of the later but like I one of the ones that I particularly love and which I did go back and read recently I think actually to recommend it to a student is um, Soap Suds you know the one about standing at the mirror and washing his hands and then it goes back into the the, the scene in childhood which in this starts kind of gentle and then becomes increasingly sinister as the adult gets angrier and angrier and I suppose yeah the angry voice kind of yeah um, getting annoyed with me in there is probably um related to the, yeah. the angry croquet yeah. voice yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you can definitely hear that, that kind of that kind of same noise that you want in the poem that McNeese so, is so brilliant at, at doing as well um but to, but to go back to this sense of the uh, i suppose of the ecological and the environmental and the sense of of where the human fits in the in the natural world and among the objects and other animals I don't think anybody has written as much about horses as you have, um, but uh, and there are, there are a number of terrific poems about horses and about horse riding in this book as well. Um, but the poem that you mentioned you'd like to read is um, well, it's a it's a killer of a little poem, uh, kitten. <laughs> so I wonder if you could talk a little. Bit. I suppose I did want to ask you a little bit about afterwards, maybe about about how you feel about writing about the natural world, which has become such a theme for so many good poets in the last 20 years or so again. Um, but anyway, it'd be great to hear this poem. Sure, yeah. Um, a very small poem <laughs> um, about a very small entity. Um, the only thing about which I'll say before I read it is just that my, um, so I grew up in a house full of cats. My parents both loved cats, always had cats around. My first cat um, of my own, um, never cried in the car, which I had never experienced before. Like all of the cats that we had when I was a child screeched like from one end of the journey to the other. And uh, this was something I got used to, but the very first time I had him in the car, um, I thought he was dead because, <laughs> because he didn't make any noise. So, uh, kitten. Bringing him home in the car. A hand cup's white spatter of fur in a carry box, the scale of the cavernous blue to Jonah. You thought him dead of a heart attack and halted to check. In what you remember is the dark, but can't have been given it was summer. 
round eyes met your hazel stare. The throat withheld its music. Wary as muscles, the lungs creaked on their fragile string. Your face against the grid, blunt as a shark. <laughs> very good. Yeah, if there's something um, very fragile and full of threat <laughs> around that poem, Miriam, and there is a later poem in the book in which terrible things happen to other cats in that recliner poem. Oh, well, well, it's the same, one of them's the same cat. No! Um, he did. <laughs> well, no, no, neither of them, nothing, nothing, actually, they just both tried in various or in various ways put themselves in great jeopardy in that recliner so that one got in under the seat um I see. Uh, so if it had been sat on he would have been squashed and the other one got got tied up in an <laughs> elastic that was off of the yeah <laughs> um, they're very perilously small and very perilously curious as well kittens yes, <laughs> yes, yes um do you do you have a sense of how of the of these other poets who are writing so brilliantly about uh, but I, I know the people I'm thinking of, people like Kathleen Jamie and um, Alice Oswald, I suppose, in particular. Um, and we were just talking before about, about your own essay on D.H. Lawrence and, and uh, about what you, you feel. Do you feel you're, you're joining the same conversation as that they're in, Miriam, with these poems? Yeah, I think that's a really difficult question for me to um, answer clearly, I suppose. I mean, obviously, um, um, aware of and, and admiring of um, the work that she mentioned and I think um, probably I, I used to go to a like a poetry reading group at Queen's in Belfast as well as the writing group and I um, certainly we we looked at the treehouse um, or we did the treehouse um, as one of the books that we looked at in that group at a kind of formative point for me early in my PhD when I was just starting to like really take the idea of my own writing um, seriously and we, we may have looked at Woods etc as well which uh, is a book I really love. Um, uh, you mentioned Lawrence, uh, Birds, Beasts and Flowers, I just think it's an extremely extraordinary uh, book and I, but there's so many people you know like I'm kind of thinking like Jen Hadfield say as well, um, Jane Ye who writes about animals and just in a way you know like uh, it's just so playful and brilliant um so <laughs> she has a kitten's poem as well actually where she kind of ref she refers to them as like demented marshmallows or something <laughs> like that which, i mean and so i think you know um i don't know that i i don't know whether my poems by animals are like the work of any of these other writers um i suppose that you know that they share the same basic investment in <laughs> recognition of the fact that we aren't the only things here and aren't the only things of importance or interest here um, um les murray as well i mean yeah. you know like that's translation from the that's natural a, world yeah. that's a great comparison i think because he has that great doesn't that way he tries to get close to the other consciousness almost and yeah which i can't the, you know um so th that level of i mean i think he in a way almost closed that down for everybody else because he did it so brilliantly yeah. you know bit, like I, there's one poem in this book which is kind of partially in a human voice and partially in the voice of a fox um, yeah. called Siete Lagunas, which uh, was inspired by a fox stealing our food in the middle of the night uh, on the top of a mountain in Spain. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, but uh, generally, I don't, you know, go there in terms of trying to inhabit, um, trying to speak from the perspective of an animal. Jen Hadfield does it very well yeah. too. Actually, um, I tend to be more just write about rather than write as. No, very interesting though and it does seem like it's one of these places where a lot of interesting work is you know risky when interesting work is going on all those none of those poets are 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 uh, they're all they're all originals aren't they writing kind of independently i think about animals in their own ways um i, I wanted to finish miriam by asking you a little bit about and uh, you know the belfast reading group and writing groups i suppose that you were involved with as a, at a formative time um in your own writing and I suppose which still is, it seems to be so abundant in terms of new interesting poets um, coming out of that world. And it's always a poetry which seems to me to be so aware of its, of its place in relation to other kinds of poetry. You know, it's very self-aware about the importance of 
trying to make your own noise as a poet in relation, like, you know, it's not um, imitative um, in any way. And um, there are always new, new things happening in relation to what has already happened, especially, I suppose, in the last 20 years or so. It's, or so, so it seems to me there are so many different kinds of voices coming out of that. And I wondered if you could say something um, Belfast is a real presence in some of the streets and houses and people that you remember in this book um, and you might read one of those poems but I wondered as well if you could say something about um, about what that meant for you as or what it still means for you as a writer. Yeah I mean I think the the kind of poetic life around Queen's when I was there so I did um, both of my postgraduate degrees in Queen's and I didn't you know I didn't I was really ignorant I didn't know really that there was no <laughs> stuff going on in Belfast in fact I'd wanted to do a master's degree in Dublin that I was going out with somebody who would go beyond Bangor you know <laughs> so, like, uh, so uh, I ended up in Queen's you know more or less just because he wouldn't go anywhere else but um, I was so lucky you know such a sort of stroke of serendipitous luck that I ended up there at a point where like Sinead Morrissey was the run residence, Kieran Carson was running the, the Heaney Centre, um, the Longleys were around, you know, just um, Leontia Flynn there, you know, um, so much, um, just such fertile ground, you know, and I think Queen's is really, you know, the atmosphere there um, around the Heaney Centre, certainly that I was involved in, was just really um, fostering, I think, you know, that so when I go back now, everybody, you know, the staff go out to events with people, uh, with the students, they go to the pub afterwards, the PhD students talk to the master's students and talk to the undergraduate students, you know, and it, there's like a... Um, there's a real investment, I feel, in the idea of, of, a, of a poetry community, which I hugely benefited from and still miss, I think, you know, um, I feel in a way maybe still my, um, the most um, important uh, kind of poetry, imaginative, intellectual community I, I have is maybe, you know, still there I guess just because there's so maybe there's so there's always so much stuff going on in Edinburgh that it's hard to kind of whereas in Belfast there was the thing of every fortnight there was a reading and you went to the reading and then you went to the Haney Centre and drank wine and then you went to the pub after after the Haney Centre and you know um everything sort of centred for me anyway around um uh, a small but very um productive <laughs> and very diverse um, set of people and, and set of happenings. It was such a, it was like, I know, I, know I, I think I met you first up there and I, I just remember that the PhD crew were, you know, just a, a really great tight set, tight knit set of people who had, you know, who'd been having um, the same kinds of arguments and to and fro, <laughs> which I really enjoyed um, uh, witnessing, you know, and, and, uh, and hearing. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's still a great it's a it's a real poetry town, Belfast. I think, and I always I've always thought of it like that. And still, whenever I do go back, it always seems to me that it's, it's still the case. Um, would Would you mind reading um, in in the Annum, uh, Miriam, which sure. takes us back there? <laughs> well, <laughs> it depends whether it's so. It's um, normally say about this poem that I mean it is kind of um, slightly vague about the anim <laughs> in which it in which it exists but uh, like sometime in the early 90s you know and, um, it's not particularly true to the surface details of Belfast in the early 90s although there is some stuff in it that is um, uh, kind of empirically true um, but it's more a, a kind of attempt to inhabit the um, the psyche of the city, I, I guess, at that uh, at that point when I was um, kind of eleven or, or twelve, and just ahead of um, when things started to change for the better in Belfast. So it, um, and the Longley has a nice phrase where she talks. It's something about like poetry having a finger to the wind, you know, before things happen. That there's there's a sense of it in poetry, which this obviously isn't. It's more of a like a retrospective <laughs> finger to the wind than a than a prospective finger to the wind but um it's it has a sense of you know having a sense of something in the air of, of things being on the cusp of, of changing i guess in the anim in the anim of the weather 
of Anderson and Macaulay, of the linen store, of wind flinging itself like an illegal logger on the scent of mahogany ceaselessly along Royal Avenue's brittle core, in the annum of the occupants before, the occupants before the annunciation of Tesco, in the annum, in the annum when the public chose as its favoured means of adornment of the civitas and bird murder, the malleable beauty of plastic, flung with a gay abandon in its various forms, this to the wind like a logger seeking mahogany. When the river acquired solemnly a symphony of plastic, accompanied by bellows and drums, in the annum, in the annum of the water bomb, of dog turds crusted on the street and the key to the kingdom, in the annum of the girl's shoe with a key in the heel and of Lloyd Grossman's through the keyhole, of the loch's coagulate scum, in the annum of the one known homeless one, of five lighters for a pound, the annum of the underground melody, in the annum that preceded American beauty, in the annum of the ultrasound of the city, in the annum of the wind that stung like an illegal logger sniffing out mahogany through the packed straits of the forest like a disease and strummed to the river's choked threnody and past the party where a child wants shoes with keys in the heel to ploy with the fingers of the one known homeless one. In the annum of the kingdom come where dirt filed fingers ran like birds in the loft of the brain up and down the throat of a whistle a clutch of green-tipped metal in the hands of the homeless one, as senseless and absolute as rain. In the annum of the end of the end of days, though scarcely recognised as such, the unknown herald brought to them a different voice. That's great, Miriam. It's a brilliant poem and it's fantastic to hear it um, read out loud. Um, I think we're going to finish up now, but I wonder if you could show us the cover of the book because I think it's a it's a it's a cracking <laughs> cover as well, just to encourage people who are watching this. Um, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great cover. Um, but do um, do go and buy What Planet, um, and congratulations again on winning the Pig Prize. And I hope I'll see you in Listowel um, in 2021 for Writers Week. I very much hope so too. All right, take care. Bye, Maria.